we thought that digitization would transform the way that we do business. What we found out was one, it's expensive, two, it's labor intensive, and three, people still need to be together. Mm -hmm. So for us here at the Schomburg Center in particular, we have embraced this moment as an opportunity to rebuild community, to rebuild a space of collective gathering. So at the same time that we offer people immediate access to historical newspapers, everybody up here who writes about something in the past knows that with a couple of keystrokes, you can read every article from the Defender to the Amsterdam News to the Chicago mm -hmm. Tribune in light speed. Work. When we first all started doing Twitter, right, and we still have colleagues now, right, who are like, Twitter, what's that, right? You know, why, why are you wasting your time with that, right? Because Twitter is hungry for information. That's right. Twitter is hungry for knowledge, and in the absence of folks with quality information for them, they will take innovation, information from any place, right? right? And I can name some names off the top of my head, and some of you know who I'm talking about, and I ain't got the name of the names, but you know who I'm talking about. I do. When I said that I wanted to be in community, I will go talk to any group of people. If I can fit it into the schedule and I got time, yeah. you ain't got to pay me for everything. I don't get paid for everything that I do. I care about connecting with folks and translating ideas. Here's another thing that I know. When I was a college student at Howard in the late 1990s, that's the first time I saw Dr. Dyson on TV. And I sit on this stage today because I saw him on TV and I said, I want to do that shit. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's it. But, but here's why I wanted to do it. It was cool that he was on TV, but that wasn't the thing that moved me. It was that he was saying really intelligent stuff. And that and to get on TV and to say this kind of intelligent stuff is about a fundamental respect for black people, right? But being black is being controversial, right? It is simply that we're in this room assembled around this conversation. We're saying that there are certain things that either we stand for or that we're interested in. If you express them publicly, anybody is subject to losing their livelihood. So you have to be on the ground in the community in order to accept that critique. But I, I, don't, I don't think anyone up here is afraid of critique because if you, you, if you follow, follow Brittany or Jamila on, <laughs> on, on Twitter, they're being critiqued in some fairly nasty ways on a regular basis, but they are, they're brilliant how they handle it sometimes, right? Absolutely brilliant how they handle it. And I actually follow them to see how they handle the people who are trying to check them so I can learn how you can check people who are trying to handle, you know, come at you in ignorant ways. And so I think, I don't think anybody up here is, is afraid of critique uh, or, or is able to avoid it. You can't live and breathe in the spaces that some of us are in and not get the critique directly from the community, which is, by the way, the way I want it. I want people to, to come to me and feel, I want to feel accessible to people. You can ask me anything. That people whose names we don't know made possible for us to enjoy. So when Howard Thurman, the great mystic, said, our slave foreparents refused the temptation to reduce their dreams to the event that was before them because they couldn't, they didn't allow slavery to define or exhaust their imagination. Mm -hmm. They couldn't tell what was coming, but they believed something was coming, right? And so we are the manifestation of that hope. 